there and welcome to PhD at Living. Have you ever wondered how we got maple syrup? Was somebody just walking around the woods and saw a deer licking a tree and was like, yeah, let's stab the tree and grab a bunch of that and boil it and see what happens? Or was it like any number of artificial sweeteners and somebody accidentally touched a tree with sap on it and then licked it, which why, and discovered it had a very mildly sweet taste? At any rate, we now have this amazing viscous liquid gold called maple syrup. And per usual, there's at least a little bit of sweet chemistry in there. Yes, sugar pun! Real quick, I say syrup because I'm an uncultured country bumpkin. If you want to be super bougie and say syrup, well, you go right on ahead. We know syrup comes from trees, which means it has... Hang on. Yeah, close enough to biology that we're going to need a ruling on that. Judge? I'll allow it, but get where you're going, counselor. Right, well, enough of that. Let's go to the board. The xylem is the part of the tree that carries fluids upward and has the sap solution in it. Along with other minerals and nutrients, the xylem sap in maple trees has the sugar in it we're trying to make syrup out of. Think of it like tree blood. Red, sugar, and black maple trees are the best ones for making syrup because they have relatively high sucrose content. Although in this case, relatively high means about 3% or so. Recall that sucrose is a disaccharide of the monosaccharides, glucose, and fructose. If none of this is ringing a bell at all, do check out my sugar series, which goes into a deep background. Also, the trees store starch in the winter as fuel and convert that starch into sugars to eat on during the lean winter months. In the early spring, that converted starch sugar starts to climb the tree via the xylem. My wife and I used to tap maple trees when we lived in New England, and the best time for tapping season is when the temperature is below freezing during the night, but above freezing during the day. Reason being, during the relatively warm and sunshine-exposed day, the tree can send the sap up to give itself nutrients, and during the night, when it gets cold, can send the sap back down into the relatively warm and insulated ground portion, so the sap doesn't get trapped up here, freeze, when water freezes it expands, and blow off parts of the tree. Summary here being, the best time to get sap is when you have consistently moving sap, because you can get that sap out of the tree and make syrup with it. Holes. If we keep with the analogy that sap is like tree blood, then these holes you drill are like stab wounds. Are drilled in the side of the tree, and then taps, really big diameter needles, are hammered in to collect the syrup. At that point, you can either attach a series of lines to your tree system to bring the sap to a central location, um, IV tubes but in reverse, or more simply, you can just hang a bucket from the side of the tree. Uh, I got nothing on that one. At that point, it's a simple boiling process to take all that sap you have, drive off the water, and create a concentrated sugar solution that we otherwise know as syrup. The generally accepted density of syrup is 66 degrees on the Brick scale, named after German mathematician Adolf Ferdinand Wenceslas Brix. One degree on the Brick scale, abbreviated degree Bx, is one gram of sucrose per hundred grams of solution. Yeah, one gram per hundred grams equals one degree. Your guess is as good as mine. Boiled for too long, the syrup crystallizes because it goes past its saturation point. Not boiled long enough, and the syrup is too watery and can likely spoil via fermentation. This is sort of like making mead, which is a product made from another biologically available sugar solution, i.e. honey. The syrup's also filtered to remove something called sugar sand. While not harmful, the sugar sand does affect mouthfeel and is usually composed of slightly crystallized sugar particles and calcium malate. Here's where it gets really interesting. You can also make syrup by a process called reverse osmosis, which is more efficient than just boiling. To know what reverse osmosis is, however, you have to know what regular old osmosis is. Osmosis is the spontaneous net movement of solvent particles through blah, blah, blah. Let's talk it this way. Say you have two solutions that are separated by a semi-permeable membrane. Semi-permeable means that the membrane allows small particles, like liquids, to pass through it, but big, chunky particles, like solids, are not going to pass through it. These two solutions have different concentrations of solute, meaning that one is going to be more concentrated and the other one is going to be less concentrated. Let's represent our higher concentrated solution by these giant blue dots, and the lower concentrated solution is going to be this one. Here's where osmosis comes into play. Completely spontaneously, without us doing anything to these solutions, the area of higher solvent concentration is going to flow through the semi-permeable membrane into the area of lower solvent concentration. But wait! 
I just switched the entire nomenclature of concentration you've been used to listening about. And this is why osmosis is a little bit tricky. We usually talk about concentration in regard to the solute. That is to say, this is the more concentrated solution because there are more blue dots per unit solvent. This one is less concentrated because there are fewer blue dots. In osmosis, we don't talk about the solute, we talk about the solvent. So there is a movement from high solvent concentration to low solvent concentration, meaning that this is the one that's going to flow. This one has more solvent per unit solute, so it's going to pass through the semi-permeable membrane this way and get into the area of lower solvent concentration. This, my friends, is osmosis, the spontaneous passage through a semi-permeable membrane of solvent from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Savvy? Now here's where it's applied to syrup. There is a pressure on this system, called the osmotic pressure, that you can apply to this side of the system that stops the flow of solvent altogether. If you apply a pressure higher than the osmotic pressure, you can not only stop the flow of solvent, but in fact reverse the flow of solvent, now moving it from an area of low solvent concentration to an area of high solvent concentration, thus making your already concentrated, now talking about the solute, the more concentrated blue dot solution over here, more concentrated than it was already. This process of reversing the osmotic flow via using a higher than osmotic pressure is called, and this is going to blow your mind, reverse osmosis. Now, instead of boiling off all that water to make your syrup, you just hook your sap up to one of these semi-permeable membranes, put some less concentrated water on the other side, and then just hammer it with some really high pressure to drive that reverse osmosis and send the water from the already fairly sugar-concentrated solution to making it even more concentrated sugar solution, i.e. syrup. By now, you well know my penchant for tangents, and I think this one might be my favorite ever. Osmosis was first discovered by French scientist Jean-Antoine Nollet, but that's boring. What isn't boring is what Nollet did with electricity. Call your local IRB and listen to these experiments. In one experiment, Nollet wrapped a small boy in insulating silk cloth, suspended him from the ceiling, and electrified him. I'll say that again. Nollet wrapped a young child in insulating silk cloth, dangled the child from the ceiling, and then electrified him. Electrified a child. He electrified a child. As if that wasn't enough, Nollet then took objects and put them close to the dangling, suspended, electrified minor and showed attraction to it. And that was science. And people did that. Imagine doing that today. Temporal double standard, if you ask me. In another experiment, Nollet took 200 monks, not sure why they had to be religious people, but anyway, 200 monks and put them in a circle about a mile around, all holding a piece of wire. You can see where this is going. Nole then discharged a bunch of batteries into the wire and observed the effect on the holy men. That is to say, they all got electrocuted at the same time. This led Nole to conclude that electricity moved real wicked fast, y'all, and also that you could do practically anything to somebody in the 1700s as long as you said it was for science. All right, now that we've talked about how syrup is made, we need to talk about how it's evaluated for consumption. Legacy grading methods vary wildly, but as of 2014 or so, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency and the USDA here in the United States have agreed pretty well on what the rules are. Maple syrup for mass consumption is listed as grade A and has four subcomponent profiles of color and taste. Golden color, delicate taste, amber color, rich taste, dark color, robust taste, and very dark color, strong taste. Not gonna lie, I'm a little disappointed in this one. With adjectives such as golden, delicate, robust, you'd think they could have come up with something better than very dark, tenebrous, stygian, something like that. With those as the qualitative metrics of depth of flavor and taste for syrup, we here at PhD at Living like a little more quantitative analysis, and the main differentiator here seems to be UV vis, or ultraviolet visible spectroscopy. Here's a very general block diagram. Your light source shines onto a monochromator that selects a wavelength to interrogate your sample that's then seen by the detector for your analysis. Let's break these down. The light source here is usually either a tungsten filament that's similar to a regular old incandescent light bulb, or a deuterium bulb. The tungsten filament, when heated, spits out a continuous array of wavelengths from just slightly ultraviolet, maybe less than 450 nanometers, to well into the infrared, greater than 700 nanometers. This is accomplished through atomic emission, that is to say electrons move from a ground state to an energized state, and when they move back down they emit a photon of a given energy that has a given wavelength that, if it's in a narrow 
range we can see is interpreted by our eyeballs as color. The deuterium bulb has a tungsten filament, but the effect is slightly different. While the regular tungsten filament incandescent bulb is filled with inert gas with just a splash of halogen, such as bromine for longevity, the deuterium bulb is filled almost exclusively with diatomic deuterium. What happens here when the tungsten filament is heated is the entire deuterium molecule is excited and creates molecular emission. So the whole molecule is emitting, not just an electron as part of one of the atoms. This molecular emission is what creates the wide majority of your ultraviolet wavelengths, well less than 450 nanometers, that your UV vis detector can see. Moving on, the monochromator, as the name suggests, splits that light source into its constituent individual mono wavelengths, or colors, chroma, to interrogate your sample. You pick an individual wavelength and you see how much of that wavelength the sample absorbs relative to a standard. You can then see, based on that absorption, how much of a given material is in your sample, i.e. concentration. For syrup, we're looking at the amount of sugar or other sugary stuff molecules that are in there, so the very, very dark ones are going to absorb more of that wavelength and give you a relatively less response for your detector to detect. Speaking of the detector, the ones I'm used to working with here are charge coupled devices, or CCDs. They're basically very simple electronic components that are way beyond my realm of ability to explain. Suffice to say, they take the sample, interrogated source, wavelength, light, stuff, signal, and convert that into an electronic thing that the components of the UV-Vis instrument can do something with. And that's basically UV-Vis. The syrup grades we're talking about are measured for their transmittance, that is what percent of light gets through the sample to be detected at 560 nanometers. For those of you exceedingly interested, golden is greater than 75% transmittance, amber is 50 to 74.9% transmittance, dark is 25 to 499 and very dark is less than 25%. You're welcome. At this point, I gotta apologize, because I haven't really told you the whole story here, including, you know, the actual chemicals in maple syrup. Sorry about that. While you absolutely, via reverse osmosis, can manufacture syrup, as defined by the brick scales, proper amount of sucrose per unit solution, that stuff probably wouldn't look or taste very syrup-y. It'd likely have very high transmittance on the UV vis and wouldn't even qualify as golden syrup because it's missing those beautiful deep caramel based compounds you get from the boiling process. At some point in your conversion from sap to syrup, you have to subject the stuff to heat, which hydrolyzes the sucrose's glycosidic bond, giving you your constituent glucoses and fructoses that then swirl around in that beautiful sugar maelstrom and give you your caramelands, caramelens, and caramelin compounds that we talked about in our caramel videos and give those sugar-based confectionaries their beautiful colors and flavors. In summary, reverse osmosis is absolutely more efficient than boiling to get you the majority of the way to your syrup, but to get those flavor compounds and the color, you just gotta heat the stuff up. The differences in the syrup grades then just come down to how long you've boiled it and to what degree you've gotten those longer chain, higher order polysaccharides. Syrup does have other vitamins and minerals and a little splash of amino acids and carboxylic acids, but for the most part it really is just water and sugar caramel based stuff. Sorry, it's not more exciting. For what it's worth, I usually go for the dark color, robust flavor stuff. The very dark, strong flavor syrup isn't often found at the front end of the grocery store because, if you can believe it, it's considered to have an almost too mapley flavor. Don't worry though, it isn't thrown away. It's in fact used on the commercial end for a lot of baked goods and other maple flavored foodstuffs. Here's one for you. Real syrup is wicked expensive. Women are dirt cheap. So what gives? Well, turns out those syrups aren't legally allowed to put maple in the name because they are in fact fake syrups. How do they get that syrupy taste, you ask? Well, it's a combination of our old friend high fructose corn syrup and a compound called sodalone. Sodalone, E in the name optional, is a lactone, meaning it's a combination carboxylic acid alcohol that is sterified with itself. I got a buddy in high school that got caught self-esterifying. <laughs> That's embarrassing. Anyway, sodalone is very prevalent in fenugreek and at low concentrations, interestingly enough, smells and tastes a lot like maple syrup. Some people have a genetic defect wherein they produce sodalone and excrete it, causing, and I cannot believe this is a real thing I'm talking about, maple syrup urine disease. Yeah. And on that note, that's the chemistry of maple syrup. Stabbing trees for their blood, electrocuting children and the clergy in the name of science, and pee that smells like hotcakes. 
You don't get that anywhere else, folks. See you next time. See, there you have it. You're doing it all wrong. You gotta open your throat, relax the jaw.